Uh, well, good afternoon, folks. Um, I wasn't quite sure why I got placed in this session, but after thinking about it, uh, it does actually make quite a bit of sense. Uh, a lot of today has been about policy. This is going to be a talk about implementation of policy. So you guys all know Luthra. The Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve is right in here at the, the middle of the, uh, the island. So the, I'm going to just go quickly through the background on this. Most of you have probably heard about it. Uh, the Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve is a dream child of this woman, Shelby White. Uh, her and her husband, Leon Levy, had been coming to Luthra uh, since the 1960s, bought a house uh, near Governor's Harbor in the 1980s. Loved the island, loved their staff, loved their people, uh, would come down four, five, six times a year. Uh, Leon did very well, very well. Um, very philanthropic. Uh, he, he unfortunately passed away in 2003, but pr previous to his death, he had talked about doing some sort of botanical garden project that would showcase native plants and bush medicine, things like that. Uh, a couple years after his death, Shelby White came to the National Trust with the idea of building a botanical garden showcasing native plants on Eleuthera. Fast forward 10 years, we have done it. So just quickly on development, uh, we surveyed land and had acquired it between 2006 and 2008. Uh, we went through a phase one development building most of our main infrastructure and opened our doors to the public March 24th, 2011. Uh, after a couple years of operations, we engaged in a phase two with four more new features. Uh, and then over the last few years, we've been doing operations, but I've been working on the development of our own science and conservation program. So quickly, this is the, the preserve. It's 25 acres. It has a mile and a half of trail, a series of features, mangroves, medicinal plant displays, uh, general plant displays, a lath house for native plant production. We did a freshwater wetland, edible history, overlook tower. All kinds of good stuff. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Oh. So science and conservation at the Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve. For the first few years, we were primarily focused on just documenting natural history. We had a series of scientists come in to do reports about the place, focusing on all of these seven areas. Now, of those seven areas, four of them, the, the ones to the left, are ones that we've continued working on to acquire data and, and study. So uh, anthropo or arthropods, but primarily uh, entomology, was being done by Dr. Paul DeLuca. He was a, a faculty member here at the College of Bahamas, and he would come over and work on our collections. Uh, and we developed a whole series of drawers so that we can use them to do education. Um, he has documented 307 species of insects, but for us, most importantly, uh, he discovered a new species that Katie did. This will be published this, uh, this year. Uh, and it will be named after Leon Levy. Uh, when it comes to ornithology, we haven't had a focus program per se. We've had a lot of ornithologists come through over time. We get their species lists. We've been writing it up. Uh, but recently, we have have Alana Johnson, who is, uh, works for us, and she's taken up the mantle of studying uh, ornithology at the preserve. So she actually, as part of her job, is dedicated to going around at least once a week just to survey all the birds at the preserve and make sure we have an accurate list of what's coming in where and we're knowing when new things are coming through. Uh, climatology and weather. Uh, very early on, we talked about putting in a weather station so that we could monitor the environment, so we could track climate change and things like that. We got the yes and we built that. So this is a uh, nine meter tower at the top of our center ridge. We are doing seven variables. We're doing them in very fine detail. So five minute, 15 minute, 60 minute, 24 hour increments. Uh, we wanted that fine level of detail because it allows us to track whether we're seeing things and changes in intensity and lengths of storms and how they're coming through. Um, it, it seems like a lot of data it is a lot of data, but the storage of the data is actually incredibly small. My, five minute data after two and a half years only comes to 38 megabytes. What's nice about this is we purposely overbought our data logger. Uh, this is the CR1000. It, is a, it can hold a lot of data. It can re record a lot of different sensors. We only have those seven sensors up. Campbell Scientific uh, has 38 different sans sensors that you can put onto this machine. If there are scientists out there that want to study other variables, I encourage you to contact sci Campbell, sci Campbell Scientific to find out what they have. Uh, we can easily put it on. It's a plug-and-play system. So what did some of our data look like? Uh, 
So this is our monthly rainfall. Uh, we get wet, wetter summers and drier winters, no surprise there. Uh, 2015 was a wetter year than 2014. Um, we have data for 2013. It's totally meaningless because we only started collecting in August, and we have just a little bit of data for 2016. Uh, but our, our temperature data, uh, we seem to get more variation in our winter data than our summer data. But in general, we can draw almost no conclusions from this data at this point in time. It's just a couple years worth of data. Sometime in the next 10 to 15 years, we'll probably see some more patterns emerge. But we are recording it. We are archiving it. Uh, when it works, it's live on our, our website. But if there are any scientists that want to get access to this data for Eleuther, they can feel free to contact me. We're, we're happy to give it out just as long as we're cited. So when I was going for the weather station, talking to the, the, the rep from the company, we were talking about which sensors to get. It was like, you know, we should get a couple more sensors and let's stick them in the forest. So we got an extra temperature, relative uh, humidity, and radiant light sensor and ran them into the forest so we could see what was going on in the forest in relation to what's going out outside of the forest because it seemed like it might be an interesting idea. For me, my thoughts going into it was that we would have less variation within the forest and more variation on our tower. Turned out the exact opposite was true. We get a lot more variation inside the forest. It gets warmer during the day, it gets cooler during the night, and it, it tracks true for uh, relative humidity as well. And, after, and this is something that was true across seasons. So if you go to your, 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 your spring, your summer, your fall, you're seeing the exact same pattern. And basically what's happening is you get sunlight coming through the forest canopy. It's basically heating up the air inside the forest. That air is not moving, so that temperature builds up. And then the reverse is true at night when cold air sinks and it settles onto the forest floor. Long-term goals for that is to have access to the archive data via the website so that anybody could go in and play with the data. Um, that students can go in and access this and, and see the relationship between temperature and humidity and change over time. Researchers are, are of course, available to it. Uh, and then this is part of our permanent forest plot project. So permanent forest plots. This is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Uh, these are standardized methodologies that people do all across the globe. It's a 20 meter by 20 meter plot. We marked it uh, permanently along its edges, and then every tree with a diameter above 2.5 centimeters in diameter gets its own uh, numeric tag. And then we identify the species, we record its basal area at, at breast height, and then we can calculate relative frequencies, or, or re relative densities, and then uh, basal areas. And it allows us to categorize our forest and what its structure is like. Uh, we have set up two of these. We'll set up a third this summer. So the first one, which is near the weather station, was very dominated by just a couple species, uh, pigeon plum, the Coccoloba diversifolia, as well as darling plum. Uh, compared to our second one, which was out by the tower, this one was a lot more diverse. It had just more species in it and a lot, a lot bigger trees. Um, overall, we want to compare it to other studies. Our dominance that came through were similar to the dominance that you saw uh, that Mark Daniels talked about, as well as something, a paper that came out last year, or I guess two years now, uh, where uh, uh, Dr. Franklin, in conjunction with a bunch of others, started looking at uh, variation across uh, a longitudinal gradient. And they looked at across Abaco and then across uh, Eleuthera, and our data fit just right in with where theirs was. And a lot of it was happening is that we were thinking there'd be a longitudinal gradient and just a change of forest types as you go down through the archipelago. And that's not really the way it occurs. It does occur across the large scale. But what you have is similarities between plots on different islands and then plots that are really close to each other, which are not alike at all, like what we saw at the preserve. Those plots are only a couple hundred meters apart at most, but have a completely different uh, assemblage of species and dominance. Okay, so what are we doing beyond just recording what's in there? Uh, because they're permanently tagged, we will come in every couple years, depending on, on what interval we choose, and then resample those, those trees. We'll start looking at growth rates. With growth rates, we can compare species. Once you have growth rates, you can get carbon density and start talking about carbon sequestration and the rates of how much of a carbon sink that forest is. And then looking at things like how weather events affect what's going on in the forest. And the idea is that you could bring in multiple scientists, have a real clean study of that particular area, and try and understand the relationships between weather, 
plant growth, and then all the other organisms that use it. So plant conservation. All right. So in 1992, we had the Convention on Biological Diversity. And out of that came the Rio Accord, which was great. Everybody liked it, except the botanists. Um, the reason we didn't like it, because it's a really human and animal-centric document. And the policies and things that are in it were very focused on that. Uh, the botanists got together. They get together every 10 years and did a World Botanical Congress and came up with uh, something called the Grand Canaria uh, Declaration. And in this, they put together something called the Global Partnership for Plant Conservation. They got together and they set forth a whole series of goals that countries should try and do and then uh, came up with a, a, a specific document called the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation. The strategy has seven objectives and 16 targets. I'm not going to talk about inject objectives. Those are kind of big, lofty goals. I'm focusing on the targets. What are the things that we're trying to actually do to do plant conservation in the Bahamas? Of these 16 targets, at the preserve, we're pretty sure by 2020 we can hit eight of those directly. Uh, we'll assist in another four of them, and then in conjunction with the BNT, be able to hit another three. Uh, this will put us on track for our 2020 deadline to say that we are doing plant conservation in the Bahamas. So, what are the targets? Uh, target number one, an online floor of all known plants. We're probably not going to hit that one, but we'll get pretty close. So what have we done? If you go to the Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve website, we have about 250 species up. There's descriptions of them. It talks about their medicinal uses and then pictures of flowers and fruits and leaves. Eventually, we'll, if we, once we get all of them, we'll be able to organize it and hopefully it'll be some way for you to go in and actually search through it by characters and things like that. Uh, an assessment of the conservation status of all known plants. That we will not hit. We will hit primarily our rare and endemics um, because those are the ones that we want to focus on. Uh, so we are working on developing the IUCN red list for plants in the Bahamas, uh, going through the taxonomy, uh, their distributions, their ranges, what the population size is, all its habitat and ecology, and then threats, and then whatever con conser conservation actions we want to do. Um, target three. Uh, this is about taking all your methodology and making sure everybody else knows what you're doing. So we're documenting what we're doing. All our procedures are can be available if people are interested in what we're doing to do these things. Um, the next three that I'm going to talk about briefly are the ones that will be done by the BNT. Eric? So it's basically, so target four is about setting aside 15% of each ecological region. That's about setting up more parks. Target five is within those regions to go take the most species areas and get those protected within that region, parks. And target seven, that 75% of our, our threatened species are conserved in situ, parks. So target number eight. Uh, so this is about taking our rare and endangered and getting them uh, into an ex situ conservation program having them at a location, as well as getting them into horticulture. So I spend a lot of time going and collecting plants and going and getting living collections of those rare and endangered plants. And then we built ourselves a lath house, a shade house, and we're now trying to grow these plants and get them into production. So which ones do we target? Uh, there's a Land Conservation Act. Uh, that is completely useless for conservation of plants. Um, the lists of plants that are in there are not rare and endangered. They were plants that had uh, historical and cultural importance. There's even one non-native on that list. Uh, but we came out with a paper in 2014 looking at uh, endemic species in the Bahamas. Uh, this is the paper. Uh, endemic seed plants of the Bahamian archipelago. But within it, we went through and, and did the looked at the distributions of all the species. So, we set up a grid across the Bahamas. This is out of a paper I published in 2003 to break the islands apart in finer conservation units. And then we went through the distributions of all the rare and endangered and put them in uh, to that, those categories. And then you do uh, a stepwise comparison, comparing the lists of species of each of rare of endemic species on each island to see which islands are more similar to each other in their species list. And that's where you get this thing right here. Uh, each one of these is an island group here, and it's 
grouping, the, it's an un, essentially an unrooted tree, and it's grouping the islands together that have a similar index of, of species. These then become our ecological regions for botany. So in situ conservation at the preserve, we have 89 species of endemic plants. We have five of them naturally growing there at the preserve. And we've set aside that land and we protect them in situ conservation. For ex situ conservation is really breaking it into these ecological regions and then getting those rare and endangered endemics from those locations. So of the 89, I now have 30 in a living collection that are growing, can be reproductive. I have another three that I uh, got from Great Inagua a few weeks back that I have seeds that I haven't germinated yet. So we're just about a third of the way through. Uh, so this is a good example. This is my agave bed. This has been kind of a, they're all been personal projects, but this has been a, a special personal project for me. Very confusing group, very poorly described. There's supposed to be 10 species, eight of which are endemic. The last time the group was worked on was in 1905. So the descriptions are just bad. Uh, but I've, I have what I think are seven species now that I can look at and say that's different. Uh, 6 and 9 through 13, I'm not going to address. These are the ones we sort of hit indirectly. They're about things like sustainable harvesting of products, uh, about trade of, of endangered plants and stuff like that, and food security. Those are just not ones that we directly work at. So target 14, uh, the importance of plants and the need uh, for its conservation to be basically put out into all that you do. Everything that we do at the preserve is about plants to a large extent. We talk about them. We're documenting them. We're going to the schools about them, having the schools come to us. So this is something we're, we're very, very actively doing. Target 15, this is about training and capacity. Uh, it's great to have a site while it's all there, but we decided we needed to actually get and engage more young college Bahamians into this process so we can try and target and get them experience. So we developed an internship, which I'll talk about. Um, and they come in and they learn, well, I'll talk about it. So we do a, a internship every year. It's for three college Bahamian students. Uh, it's running this year from May 17th to July 1st. It's seven weeks of training in botany, geology. Uh, bring in herpetologists and ornithologists. We'll do some climatology. They all have to work on their own field research project. Uh, we cover all housing, transportation, food, and we do provide a small stipend so they don't have to work. So the global strategy, target 16, this is about networking. Uh, we have an extensive network that we've organized between groups of institutions. Uh, we work closely with Fairchild Tropical Garden and New York Botanical Garden, but I just did a trip down to Jamaica to reach out to them, to coordinate working on projects with them, and just to make sure we know who's who and, and what's going on. Uh, this fall, uh, Botanical Garden Conservation International will host the Caribbean networking meeting. Uh, I'll be going down to that to showcase the preserve, and that's about the point in time we find out just where we are in the rankings. So continuing projects. Uh, we have two permanent plots put in. We're going to put in a third this summer when the interns come, because they get to do it. Uh, we're going to continue with our seedling and nursery program. We're going to continue implementing all of these strategies for... Uh, for plant conservation, and certainly continuing the living collections. Uh, our goal is by 2020, within a five years, that we have at least half the flora in living collections at the preserve and all of the endemic species. Uh, we'll continue on weather and climatology, trying to look at long-term trends, looking at short-term trends, uh, how that affects our forest plot data. Uh, we'll continue with our internship. This program will run I don't know how long. Uh, I'd like to bring it up to four students per year. We'll, we'll see if we get the, the funding for that. Uh, and then I, I'm pretty sure our botanist, Dr. DeLuca, is coming back to the College of the Bahamas. I'm not 100%. Uh, entomologist, what did I say? Bot no, our, yeah, I'm the botanist. Uh, our entomologist, um, <laughs> that he's going to be coming back. I forget sometimes. Uh, and he's going to be back at the College of the Bahamas, and he, we re-engaged him. So over at least the next couple of years, he's going to come and continue doing the collections. Uh, for us, if you want to learn more about this, contact me. Um, I realized I didn't put in an acknowledgement section, so I'm just going to say thank you, Shelby White. 